So this lecture is intended to summarize brain structure. The next lecture will summarize brain function. The goals of this lecture are to introduce the terms used in science and medicine to describe basic brain locations and structures, to introduce the general organization of the nervous system, particularly in humans, and to introduce the importance of the blood supply to the brain. Um, there's a number of resources available, textbooks at various levels, as well as web pages. Uh, these two web pages are particularly valuable. The upper one is a website that collects the brains of a wide variety of species, not just humans, but other uh, mammals and vertebrates, so that you can get a sense of comparison of human brain relative to those of other animals on the planet. We do not have the largest or most uh, convoluted brain on the planet, it may surprise some of you to know. The second website provides an entree into a variety of other uh, web resources to human brain structure and function, uh, both in normal and abnormal situations. In getting around the planet, getting around town, we are oriented by certain, um, by, well, by the directions of the compass, north, south, east, west. Anatomists have organized different axes uh, and, and, and descriptions of orientation to orient us at, at different locations in the human brain. The top panel illustrates the three major planes of section through a human brain. We describe a sagittal section, which is right down the center, bisecting the head between the eyes. We describe, whoops, we describe a coronal section, which is uh, you know, through both ears, so to speak. Uh, and then finally, we describe a horizontal section, which parallels the floor if you're standing up straight. Now, a plane of section through the human brain at each of these orientations provides a different view. The second panel is so showing a sagittal section, a mid-sagittal section, right down the center of the brain. Uh, and we distinguish different uh, directions as follows. So the front of the brain is referred to as anterior, the back of the brain is referred to as posterior. The front of the brain is also referred to as rostral, meaning toward the nose, and the back of the brain is referred to as caudal, meaning toward the tail. Now, in animals, imagine a fish. The fish's body axis is different from ours. The head and the body are one line. And so the top of the brain and the top of the, of the back are in the same plane. In humans, when we stood up and turned our heads to look straight ahead, there's a 90 degree difference in the axis between the, the back and the head. Here is the spinal cord. And so we can refer to ventral and dorsal in the spinal cord. We wouldn't say anterior and posterior. It's just not the description. We refer to ventral, like toward the bottom of the body, and dorsal, like the dorsal fin of the fish. Now, when we come up to the brain, we refer to dorsal as the top and ventral toward the bottom. Dorsal is the top of your head. Ventral is near the chin, closer to the chin. But there's another synonymous term, superior and inferior. So superior is toward the top, inferior is toward the bottom. This nomenclature can be confusing, uh, but if you remember the, the 90 degree tilt of the head in humans and other primates, then the relationship of dorsal, ventral, and superior, inferior can be understood clearly. Now then, the next section illustrates a coronal section, capturing, let's say, both ears. And so now we see the interior of the brain and then the exterior surface. Later we'll learn that this exterior surface in this region is referred to as the cerebral cortex, cerebrum for brain and cortex for covering, like the bark of a tree. In this plane of section then, as in the sagittal section, dorsal is toward the top, and ventrals toward the bottom. 
Now, to navigate left and right, we have two more terms, lateral and medial. Your ears are lateral to your nose. Your nose is medial to your eyes. Okay? Now, there's another important attribute of the brain shown in a coronal section, then, and that is the left side and the right side. And we will learn later that the left and right sides of the human brain subserve somewhat different functions. Now then, when a radiologist shows you a brain section, you have to be very careful to understand whether he's showing the right hemisphere on the right side of the page or otherwise. When I look at you, your right hemisphere is on my left. And because radiologists are physicians and prefer to look at the image as if it were in the patient, facing the patient, often the convention is to put the left hemisphere on the right side of the page and the right on the left. It's a switch, but if you understand that you're looking at it from the point of view of the doctor seeing the patient, then it isn't a switch at all. But as we move further in brain imaging applications in law neuroscience, it would be very important to know whether the damaged part of the brain is on the left or the right. And this neurological convention or radiological convention needs to be understood carefully. At the bottom we see a horizontal section. Again, this is cutting through the surface of the brain and the interior structures. We'll learn more about them momentarily. But our uh, orientation in the horizontal section corresponds to the other two sections we just saw. So toward the front is anterior or rostral. Toward the back is caudal or posterior. And once again, toward the center or the midline is medial, and further to the side is lateral. Now, these terms of orientation can be appreciated as just like the points of a compass. We use north, south, east, west to navigate. And so we can talk intelligently about the state of Washington being in the northwest of the United States. Similarly, in the brain, we can talk about dorsal lateral cortex. That's the part of the cortex that's kind of dorsal and kind of lateral, northwest. Now, these sections also include more labels of the components of the brain. In the top section, we're showing a, a sulcus running down the side, this medial structure. And so I've used the term sulcus in describing the structure of the cerebral cortex. We distinguish sulci from gyri. So the cerebral cortex is a sheet, but to fit inside your head, it's folded. And so it forms valleys and hills. The hills are the, uh, are the gyri and the valleys are the sulci. And as we'll learn, these sulci, the characteristic ones in humans, have particular names, and that's another way of orienting yourself. This lighter structure occupying the, the, the uh, more ventral aspect of the cerebral cortex is known as the corpus callosum. This is a band of fibers connecting neurons in the two sides of the brain. Those fibers, we'll learn, are going to be called axons, and they issue from the individual neurons that occupy the cerebral cortex. So I'm beginning to use more and more terms of art, but they'll build on each other. Hang with me, and they'll all become clear. In the sagittal section, uh, more caudally, we see a structure labeled the parietal occipital sulcus. This is another sulcus that divides two lobes of the brain, the parietal lobe and the occipital lobe. And these lobes are named for the bones that are on top of them, the occipital bone of the skull and the parietal bone of the skull. Further caudal in that section is the calcarine sulcus. This is a characteristic sulcus that identifies a part of the brain that's involved in vision, visual processing. Ventral to the calcarine sulcus is a label, the cerebellum. Cerebellum means small brain. This is another important part of the brain that's attached beneath the cerebral cortex in humans. It's smaller in humans than the cerebral cortex. In other animals, the cerebellum can be much larger than the cerebral cortex. Um, starting more uh, uh, ventrally or caudally, we see a label identifying the brain stem. This is uh, 
part of the central nervous system where the transition from spinal cord to brain takes place. The brain stem is composed of collections of neurons that are important and indeed vital for heart beating, breathing, vital functions like that. When we learn about brain death, we'll distinguish uh, damage to the cerebral cortex that's irreparable and damage to the brain stem that's irreparable. Damage to the brain stem ca can cause outright death irretrievably. But damage to the cerebral cortex without damage to the brain stem uh, can result in an individual who can sustain life in a basic sense of breathing and heart beating. Working up the neuro axis from the brain stem is a structure labeled the pons. That bulging uh, structure that bulges more ventrally uh, from the brain stem. This is a collection of structures that communicates between the cerebral cortex and the cerebellum. Um, moving up, the next label identifies a protrusion hanging beneath the brain, and this is the pituitary gland, the master gland of the body. We'll learn that the nervous system controls the body in various ways. It connects to muscles for movement. It also connects to glands to control the endocrine system. One of the key elements controlling uh, the pituitary gland and connecting the nervous system with the endocrine system is the hypothalamus. Now this term reminds me to say that many of the terms used in neuroanatomy and indeed biology and science have Greek or Latin origins. Um, it's not because they're special, it's just that's the language that was used. And they're very descriptive words. They're exactly the word you would use had you spoken Latin or Greek and described the structure. So the hypothalamus is beneath the thalamus. Hypo just means beneath. You see the structure labeled the thalamus, that's a collection of nerve cells that communicate between the outside world, the other parts of the nervous system and the sensory organs, and the cerebral cortex. And so hypothalamus simply lies beneath the thalamus. And that's a run through the sagittal section. Now, the next section, the coronal section, um, labels a variety of other structures. Let's just go from left to right, uh, uh, clockwise. So I'm labeling the third ventricle. The brain, your nervous system, is a thickness uh, surrounding a tube. During development, the nervous system starts out as a tube, and the walls of the tube become very thick with cells, and that becomes the brain. The tube, the inner part of the tube, remains, and through it flows a fluid known as the cerebrospinal fluid. The third ventricle is labeled as just the, the third cavity. The other ca uh, cavities are labeled uh, above thalamus, to caudate. Uh, we see the lateral ventricle. There's lateral ventricles in both hemispheres, so the lateral ventricles, number one, number two, and the third ventricle. And the fourth ventricle lies uh, beneath the cerebellum. We see again the thalamus label. Now, let me call attention to this fact. The, the region labeled thalamus, that heart-shaped region, is, is colored darker in this plot, and it's surrounded by a lighter color of ink. We distinguish, when we do brain sections like this, we see the outer surface or the regions where there's densities of nerve cell bodies, and we call this gray matter. And the parts that aren't gray matter, we refer to as white matter, because in natural brain sections, it just looks more white. It would, it would remind you of the uh, fat on bacon. And it's called white matter uh, because it has this fatty tissue in it that helps uh, nerve impulses transmit more effectively. The cerebral cortex is comprised of many neurons bundled together, collected together. This is the gray matter. And then beneath the cerebral cortex are other densities of neurons that comprise other regions of gray matter, the thalamus being one in this section. So now we've got the corpus callosum. You see the corpus callosum that I labeled before is white matter. This is the uh, nerve cell axons connecting the two sides of the brain. We've described the cingulate uh, sulcus above. Now I'm labeling the cingulate cortex. Uh, 
And so this is an important region for uh, what's known as executive control and uh, monitoring one's performance. It will be an area that we'll see uh, a lot of activity in, in situations like uh, lie detection, for example. I've labeled gyrus and sulcus, as you see in the uh, right hemisphere, as I've labeled it there. So the gyrus is the, is the hill, and the sulcus is the um, valley. This is a caricature I hope you appreciate. In the uh, normal human brain, the sulci can be very deep, folding um, um, deeply almost underneath each other. I've labeled gray matter, white matter that I've described. Another major sulcus that's labeled next uh, counter, uh, clockwise is the lateral sulcus. This is a, a, a sulcus on the lateral aspect of the uh, mammalian brain. Many, many species have it. It's shared by um, primates, for example. The last structure moving clockwise around the coronal section is the hippocampus. So this is a, a, a Baroque sort of structure at the base of the temporal lobe, on the ventral aspect of the temporal lobe. The hippocampus, we'll learn, is very important for forming memories. And last, at the bottom, is the horizontal section. All right? Now, I call attention to the fact that the compass is now rotated 90 degrees. Once again, working uh, clockwise from the left, the corpus callosum, we've seen that before. That's what it looks like in that section. Third ventricle, we've seen that before. Lateral ventricle, we've seen that before. The caudate nucleus, this is another gray matter uh, uh, collection of neurons that is at the lateral aspect, forms the lateral wall of the lateral ventricle. Uh, caudate nucleus is a part of a collection of structures known as the basal ganglia that we'll learn are important for controlling the initiation of movements. And the globus pallidus, as well, is an, another component of the basal ganglia. We've labeled the thalamus again. We see another aspect of the lateral ventricle in the, the caudal aspect of the brain. So the lateral ventricle actually um, has, has a path all the way through the interior of the cerebral cortex. Uh, and then finally, we see a small segment of the cerebellum. We've, illustrated a, a plane of the horizontal section that cuts just a, just a little bit of the cerebellum. Now, I trust you appreciate that these are just three representative sections. In the sagittal plane, we could show sections all the way from the very center all the way out to the side. In coronal, we could go all the way from front to back. In horizontal, we could go all the way from top to bottom. And the web page that I directed you to in the previous uh, uh, slide, at, at those web pages, you can see and navigate for yourself through the planes of sections of the human brain uh, and see what the interior structures look like. Now let me introduce the functional subdivisions of the uh, nervous system. And we're going to start at an abstract level, and in successive slides, we'll work through the contribution of different parts of the brain, different structures, to these functions. So at a functional level, the nervous system produces outputs. It makes us move. If we don't have a nervous system, we can't move. And so those actions have consequences, right? We, we move things in the environment, and we feel ourselves moving. We have a sense of our body position in space, for example. Output from the environment the stimuli from the environment are received by the different senses that we have. We can taste things, smell things, feel things on our skin, hear things, see things. Not every creature on the planet shares all of these senses in the same degree. The senses we have work for us in our particular habitat and environment. All right? Now, we're sensitive to the outside world, but our nervous system endows us with sensitivity to the inside world as well. So we feel the motion of our muscles and joints, and we also have a sense of our interior. I mean, we've all had an upset stomach or, or a bloated feeling. We feel the interior of our body. And indeed, to survive, we need to be sensitive to these kinds of cues as well to adapt our behavior. All those inputs 
are transmitted through a collection of structures including the spinal cord, brain stem, cerebellum, basal ganglia, thalamus, cerebral cortex to perceive the stimuli and plan actions that are the appropriate actions in response to them. Do we want to uh, flee? Do we want to fight? Um, what's the appropriate response at this, at this moment in time given our goals, plans, and the environment? And finally, we need to control our behavior. And so that is accomplished by the output, which, which is where we started. It's the muscles. I mean, if we're going to shift gaze to a new location, you're going to look from me to the screen, your eyes move, and now you're regarding something differently. But the output is also uh, of an autonomic nature. And so the nervous system doesn't just control the muscles of the body, it controls the muscles of the heart and the gut, and it controls the glands. One could say that the output of the nervous system is just muscles contracting and glands secreting. Now then, let me introduce one more time uh, the components, the, the basic gross anatomical components of the nervous system. At the top of this sagittal section, we're plotting or, or uh, uh, labeling the cerebrum and the thalamus. We've described these before, and together they're known as the forebrain. We're also labeling the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla. The medulla and the pons you saw labeled before, we're adding the midbrain to it. Collectively, we will refer to these as the brainstem. They have a shared function of, of, of maintaining the, the lowest level functions of um, maintaining life. As I said, keeping your heart beating, keeping you breathing, um, inducing vomit if you've ingested a poison, a variety of functions like that that need to be uh, uh, done to maintain survival. We're labeling the cerebellum and then running off into the spinal cord labeled below. So these are major subdivisions of the central nervous system. Now then, the brain is a very important organ. It is therefore protected in your body in a variety of ways. This is a diagram illustrating the protective coverings of the brain. So in this diagram, you see the cerebral cortex. It's now in color. To get to your brain, what would I have to do? I would have to make an incision in your skin at the top. Beneath the skin is the skull, as you all know. So to get access to your brain, I would have to make a hole in your skull. That's not the end of it. There's another protective covering. It's labeled dura matter, and, um, drawn in a, a rather blue color. The dura matter is a leathery sort of uh, connective tissue substance that is a, a third layer of protection of the brain and the rest of the central nervous system. Opposed to the brain itself, to the cerebral cortex in this view, is another part of the meninges known as the pia matter. It follows the, the, the sulci and is in, in, invaginated with the surface of the cerebral cortex, as we see it here. Between the dura matter and the pia matter is the arachnoid, another structure. Collectively, these are known as the meninges. They protect the brain structurally and nutritionally. You've heard of meningitis. This is a, an inflammation of the meninges. It can be dangerous because it's in the skull and hard to treat and can cause brain damage. We'll also, we've also seen the case of an individual, chapter two, who had a, um, abnormal growth of the arachnoid, a cyst that grew and displaced part of his brain. The nervous system is comprised of two major types of cells. The first type is neurons, and this is a cartoon version of a neuron. The neuron has uh, three major parts, an input part, a central uh, uh, metabolism part, and an output part. So the input part are referred to as dendrites. So neurons, if you see them in actual histological sections, come in various uh, shapes and sizes and branching patterns. They have as much variety as the trees and bushes on the lawns outside. 
But the dendrites are the input end of the neuron, receiving inputs from other neurons or other uh, sensory uh, structures. The dendrites branch from the cell body, otherwise known as the soma. In the cell body is the nucleus, where the uh, uh, genes make proteins that the neuron needs to survive. Those proteins then are transported up and down dendrites and also to the end of the output end of the neuron, the output structure, which is known as the axon, running from here to here. And axons can travel a large distance. All right. Now, because they're so long, we'll learn in a, f uh, a little while about the nerve impulses that are communicated along the axon. And so, because the uh, axon can be so long, the transmission can take a considerable amount of time. That time could be hazardous to the welfare of the animal in reacting to stimuli. And so nature has endowed neurons with a myelin sheath, which is this uh, fatty structure that's separated by these nodes. So the nerve impulse, instead of being transmitted continuously along the axon jumps from node to node and therefore transmits faster. A breakdown or damage to the um, myelin sheath is one of the root uh, uh, symptoms of uh, multiple sclerosis. Okay, the axons go where they're supposed to go and the wiring diagram of the brain is very complex and we won't need to concern ourselves too much with it for this course. But they can branch and go to different places altogether. Some axons from the cerebral cortex will branch and go to the basal ganglia, while another branch goes to the spinal cord, for example, sending information multiple places. Uh, at the tip or at the end of the axon, it branches some more, and it forms a specialized contact on a gland or a muscle or another neuron, the dendrites of another neuron. Neurons generate and propagate nerve impulses. This has been understood now since the uh, middle of the 1800s. The biophysics of this process are very well understood. Nobel Prizes have been awarded for that understanding. The second kind of cell in the nervous system is known as glia. This is a diverse group of, uh, neuro of, of uh, cells. For our purposes, we can just understand that there are glia and that they provide structural and metabolic support for neurons. One thing that one type of glia do is make the myelin sheath. The myelin sheath is formed or uh, uh, composed of glial cells. This is a coronal section through uh, the human brain or a, a, a cartoon of it, and we're showing it to emphasize the difference between gray matter and white matter. Gray matter consists of concentrated collections of cell bodies, primarily neurons, but also glia. And then the white matter is comprised of axons, most of them myelinated, running to and fro, connecting the different parts of the nervous system to each other. One particularly important or, or obvious uh, neuron uh, axon tract is the corpus callosum that we've referred to before. This illustrates the difference between gyri and sulci. So the lateral sulcus is this infolding of the cerebral cortex that allows the sheet to occupy less volume. The gyrus is the outer part, the hill versus the valley. This is a lateral view of uh, the human brain, simplified. We understand or refer to the different parts of the cerebral cortex as uh, lobes, named for the bones uh, overlying them. We refer to the frontal lobe, the front of the brain, anterior, the parietal lobe, the occipital lobe, and the temporal lobe. The central sulcus separates the frontal lobe from the parietal lobe. The lateral sulcus separates the temporal lobe from the frontal and the parietal lobe. Another sulcus known as the parietal occipital sulcus separates the parietal lobe from the occipital lobe. Parieto-occipital, 
You see how the anatomists use the language to tell you what they're showing you. Often the terms are combinations of terms to show you that it's a boundary or a combination of structures. Here is the inferior preoccipital notch that separates occipital lobe from temporal lobe. This is another coronal section identifying the longitudinal fissure. This is a could be referred to as a sulcus, but it's, it's much more than a sulcus. It's dividing the two halves of the cerebral cortex and associated structures. In the human brain, there are more sulci than the ones we just labeled. And this is a simplified diagram of the major sulci in the human brain. Uh, this is not necessary to commit to memory, but it will be an important reference for you because you'll hear about brain activation in or around different sulci or gyri in the human brain. And so when you read about that later, you can refer to this figure and be oriented to it. Here's the central sulcus that divides the frontal lobe from the parietal lobe. Rostral to the central sulcus is another sulcus oriented approximately the same angle. This is referred to as the precentral sulcus. The gyrus between the precentral sulcus and the central sulcus is referred to as the precentral gyrus. Rostral to the precentral gyrus are two longitudinal sulci, the superior frontal sulcus and the inferior frontal sulcus. Dorsal to the superior frontal sulcus is the superior frontal gyrus. Ventral, or inferior, to the inferior frontal sulcus is the inferior frontal gyrus. And between the superior and inferior frontal sulci is the middle frontal gyrus. We also can identify orbital frontal cortex. So this is uh, part of the cerebral cortex that's in the frontal lobe but it's sitting on the top of the orbits of the eye. Moving into the parietal cortex, so we've got the central sulcus, and now we're in the, the gyrus immediately caudal to it is the post-central gyrus. The next sulcus caudal to that is the post-central sulcus, analogous to the precentral sulcus. And then we've got another one of these longitudinal um, sulci, the intraparietal sulcus. Dorsal to it is the superior parietal lobule. Now we're using a different term, lobule. Just, it just means a, 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 a folded part of the, of the cerebral cortex, another word for gyrus, so to speak. Now then, let's move into the temporal lobe. Here's the lateral sulcus, this long sulcus separating temporal lobe from the rest of the brain. It's two longitudinal sulci, the superior uh, temporal sulcus and the inferior temporal sulcus, which divide the superior, middle, and inferior temporal gyri. Back here is occipital cortex, and these two regions are known as the supramarginal gyrus and the angular gyrus. Intriguing to look at this and wonder what function is performed by the different parts of the cerebral cortex. If one were to look at the cerebral cortex without the advantage of a microscope or uh, uh, modern histological techniques, it would look pretty uniform. It would look like one organ. But today we understand it's not one organ. It's comprised of dozens of different areas. And the areas don't always respect the boundaries imposed by gyri or sulci. So we can locate function in the cerebral cortex. The localization of function in neuroscience has been a um, challenge. It's one of the goals to understand what the function of different parts of the brain is. But we have to be careful because through the history of neuroscience, the identification of structure and function sometimes has been uh, too extreme. Here is an example. This is a diagram from the olden days of phrenology, when it was believed that very specific functions like amativeness, acquisitiveness, conjugal love, and so on were subserved by very discrete parts of the brain or the cerebral cortex. 
this view is wrong. But we will learn as we begin thinking about methods that identify the function of different parts of the brain that the phrenological bias can sneak in to the interpretation in various ways that we need to be alert to. What I want to do now is do another survey of the different parts of the cerebral cortex and describe a little bit more about their main functions. And so here we're going to focus on the frontal lobe. And so immediately in front of or embedded in the central sulcus is primary motor cortex. This is the part of the cerebral cortex that's primarily responsible for producing uh, deliberate movements of your body. When you write, when you speak, when you do complex actions of various sorts, this part of the brain is necessary. If a stroke uh, damages this part of the brain, you lose the capacity for smooth, articulated movement. On the dorsal and dorsal medial part of the frontal lobe, just in front of the central sulcus, is a region known as the supplementary motor area. We'll see that this region is involved in uh, more high-level, long-term planning of actions and the generation of intentional movements. The premotor area is another region that, that provides input to primary motor cortex and the spinal cord to shape complex behavior. So without premotor cortex, individuals are unable to produce the arbitrary responses to complex stimuli that characterize our environment. Why does green mean go and red mean stop? It's an arbitrary rule that has to be learned and executed. Primary motor cortex, the premotor area, the supplementary motor area are collectively known as a granular cortex. The, the structure of the cerebral cortex has a particular appearance that distinguishes it from all other parts of the cerebral cortex. In front of that is prefrontal cortex. Now, prefrontal cortex has many parts and components. We'll refer to dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, ventrolateral prefrontal cortex. Uh, Broca's area is a part of prefrontal and premotor cortex that's important for the production of speech. The frontal cortex extends onto the medial surface of the brain. And so this is a view, sagittal, a mid-sagittal section of the brain, and we are labeling orbital frontal cortex, this ventral component that, as I said, is situated on top of the orbits of the eye. And we're also labeling ventromedial prefrontal cortex. So it's ventral, and it's medial, and it's prefrontal, and that's where it is. So these regions, the, the prefrontal cortex is understood to be um, important for the high level control and planning of action and balancing uh, short term desires against long term goals, so on. So in thinking about the function of frontal cortex and in particular the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, uh, important lessons were learned from the mishap that occurred to this poor gentleman. This is Phineas Gage. Phineas Gage was a foreman on a uh, crew uh, making railroads and he was involved in an accident in which a tamping iron that he's holding in his left hand accidentally exploded and penetrated all the way through his head, damaging uh, the, the ventromedial prefrontal cortex and thereabouts. He survived. This is a modern reconstruction of the path of the tamping iron took through his head. It entered through under the left eye and exited over the top of the head. And so that part of his brain was damaged. He could still see, he could walk, he could talk, but he was unable to hold a job very well. One of his friends said, after the accident, Phineas wasn't Phineas anymore. Now let's concentrate on the parietal lobe. Immediately caudal to the central sulcus is primary somatosensory cortex. This is the part of the brain where your sense of touch and vibration and body sense is accomplished. At the uh, junction of the temporal and the parietal lobes is a, is a general region referred to as the temporal parietal junction. 
We're calling attention to this because it's another region that becomes activated in brain scans when people are employing something known as theory of mind, trying to impute uh, uh, beliefs onto somebody else. It has other complex functions as well. Now the temporal lobe. So primary auditory cortex, the primary region that's responsible for your sense of hearing is located in the temporal lobe. Uh, there are other components of it that are involved in recognizing more complex auditory objects like words and speech. So Wernicke's area, named for another scientist, is located at the, at the uh, caudal end of the temporal lobe and it region something like this and it's necessary for speech comprehension. The temporal lobe is also involved in recognizing visual objects and now we're invited to remind ourselves that recognizing objects entails memory, especially complex arbitrary objects uh, or even the faces of family and friends. So recognizing something means remembering it and I'll call your attention to the hippocampus, which is located in the temporal lobe. So many of these structures ultimately connect with the hippocampus to form the memories that support our recognition of objects. Damage to these parts of the brain can result in, in uh, symptoms where individuals can no longer recognize objects. There's a well-known book, you can learn more about this, by an author named Oliver Sacks. The title of the book is The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. And now the occipital lobe. This is one of the smallest but best understood parts of the brain just because of the history of neuroscience and the way the investigations have, have worked out. Uh, at the back of the occipital lobe, actually in the medial surface in humans, is the primary visual cortex. This is the staging area for our sense of sight, as elaborate as it is. We um, recognize one pathway from the primary visual cortex that extends into the temporal lobe and is necessary for object recognition. Another path issuing from primary visual cortex extends into the parietal lobe and is necessary for guiding movements in space and in sequence. And so individuals, for example, who suffer damage to the parietal lobe lose the ability to organize their movements in space or may not even recognize the existence of space itself or objects in space, even their own faces in the mirror. And so some patients with damage to the parietal lobe will only put makeup on half of their face or only shave half of their face because the other side doesn't exist anymore. They have what's known as psychic blindness. Let me now turn to the subcortical uh, systems of the brain. You've seen these labeled before. We're going to talk about the thalamus, the hypothalamus, the pituitary gland, pons, medulla or medulla oblongata, and spinal cord as well as, well as the cerebellum. The thalamus is a collection of neurons that communicate with the cerebral cortex. So in, for example, the uh, visual system, the eye receives the signals from light. Those uh, signals are transmitted to a part of the thalamus that sends input to the primary visual cortex and vision transpires. The hypothalamus, as I said, uh, is involved in um, a, a large number of uh, homeostatic uh, uh, processes, maintaining the, 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 the welfare of the body. So temperature regulation. Are you hungry? Are you thirsty? When are you no longer hungry? When are you no longer thirsty? Controlling the glands, controlling your, your daily uh, uh, daylight cycles. The sense of um, circadian rhythm is regulated by the hypothalamus. The pons connects the cerebellum and the cerebrum. The cerebellum is important for coordinated action. I could ask you to do the following demonstration. If you put your arm out to the side, close your eyes and touch your nose, you're able to do that. If you're not able to do it, we should see a neurologist. If you lose the cerebellum, you lose the ability to coordinate action like that. Uh, the medulla consists of um, nerve uh, collections that are important for well, moving the eyes, making the heart beat, respiration, and so on. Another important subcortical system is referred to as the limbic system. So neuroscientists 
see a collection of structures that may or may not be connected in certain patterns and try to understand it as a system, organized. And so the limbic system is one such collection of structures. In this diagram, these are the structures identified with the limbic system. The cingulate gyrus, part of the cerebral cortex. Uh, the olfactory bulb is at the base there. The olfactory bulb is sitting uh, right on, um, um, sort of on top of the nasal cavities, receiving inputs from the nose. The amygdala is an important component of the limbic system. The amygdala is another collection of nerve cells are important for emotional regulation and identifying the emotional valence, let's say, of visual stimuli or, or any stimulus. The hippocampus is located as indicated. This is a structure important for memory. The mammillary bodies and the hypothalamus are, are collect, well, the mammillary bodies are sort of part of the hypothalamus. This is part of the limbic system. The fornix is a bundle of fibers that's connecting the components of the limbic system. And so it's referred to as the limbic system, limbus meaning uh, to encircle or surround. It's a collection of structures that sort of surrounds um, the brainstem, in a sense. So collectively, this is an important structure for memory, emotion. A second collection of structures, subcortical structures, I referred to earlier, is the basal ganglia. The basal ganglia consists of the caudate nucleus and putamen. They're known collectively as the striatum, the globus pallidus, the subthalamic nucleus, and the substantia nigra. The wiring of the, sub, of the uh, basal ganglia is very well understood and research uh, over many years uh, with the basal ganglia has led to effective therapies for movement disorders like Parkinson's disease. So today we understand that Parkinson's disease happens when cells in a part of the substantia nigra die for reasons that are not always well understood but because they die it creates an imbalance in the regulation of the basal ganglia that can be corrected with a drug called L-DOPA. Now, it doesn't cure the disease because the cells are still dying, and so another therapy is available when the L-DOPA is no longer effective, and that is to put stimulating electrodes in the subthalamic nucleus of patients and create a sort of brain pacemaker that allows them to move in a more fluid fashion than they would have otherwise. Now we come to the blood supply of the brain. The brain is just one fortieth of the mass of the body, and yet it consumes one fifth of all the oxygen. The brain is a, is a hungry uh, metabolic machine. Uh, the human brain contains 60,000 miles of blood vessels, large and small. Neuron function and blood flow are very closely related. You can't have one without the other. And that deep relationship has afforded the ability to do what we'll learn about as brain imaging studies uh, that we'll talk about in a subsequent lecture. Neurons influence the blood vessel size through the glial cells, and there's this deep, uh, tight interaction. So this uh, figure is showing the distribution of veins, and veins in blue or black, and arteries in red, there's two major points to make with this other than under appreciating the deep connection between nerve function and blood flow. And that is that there's um, characteristic blood vessel patterns. So we refer to the middle cerebral artery, the anterior cerebral artery, the posterior cerebral artery. The part of the brain fed by these different blood systems varies across the individuals. So that if you have a stroke affecting, let's say, the middle cerebral artery, we know, in general, certain parts of the brain are going to be affected, but it will vary across individuals. 